I'm Dr. Matt Waters. I am an Associate Professor of Environmental Sciences in the Department of Crop, Soil, and Environmental Sciences here at Auburn University. I am a paleolimnologist, which is the history of lakes and rivers. So my lab uh, conducts research on sediment cores. Uh, we go to lakes, reservoirs, bays, estuaries, anything where water is pretty standing for a long period of time and we collect long tubes of mud and we can analyze a, a host of different things in this mud. The way to think of it is it's, it's a historic group of data. We need data and we do a good job of monitoring our lakes and our rivers for, for modern day problems but we don't know what happened 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. So from these mud cores, from these sediment cores, we can provide that ancient data and go back in time. So first we find out where we can core. Then we go out and, and a, a, a sediment coring device is literally like a, a, a giant uh, syringe plunk with a plunger in it where you, you pull it up but instead of pulling it up you're sliding the syringe down so we go out and we collect a core so you bring up this tube of mud and then we we do what's called extruding it so we we push up a little bit and we slice it off and then we push up a little bit more and we slice it off so we have sort of a sort of a hamburger slice of mud uh, going back in time and then we bring that back into the lab and we basically just start to divide it up. And so we can send these out to various labs because we don't specialize in everything um, and try to build the picture of, of what are, what's the data that we need to reconstruct what's happened on this land and in this water. We strongly focus on carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Um, phosphorus is more geologic, so it could come from rocks, whereas organic carbon isn't going to do that because it's organic. These things just play different roles, but also they can work together to um, cause things like eutrophication. But those are the three things that we specifically focus on. So these are the little pieces of sediment that we take from our samples. Yeah, you can see they're in metal casings, yeah. so the sediment's inside the metal casing. So that could either be tin or silver, just depending on which analysis we run. So it could give you total carbon or it could give you organic carbon. These little guys go in this auto sampler, they drop down into here and basically catch on fire. <laughs> so the gas that comes off of them is then read through this machine and based on their you know, gases it can tell you how much carbon and how much nitrogen. But these little peaks, this is our nitrogen peak, and this one is our carbon peak. So typically we're always going to have more carbon you know, in our samples than nitrogen. But yeah, this is what we get from it. Once we have our you know, percent carbon, percent nitrogen values from our sediment, then we can um, put these into a ratio of C to N. And this can tell us like what types of organic matter were in our sediment. So a higher C to N, say like 20 would tell you it was terrestrial, so it could be you know from a tree, something like that, a little bit more hardy. Um, if it was lower, maybe like nine, that would tell you that there was algae in your system. And if it was between that, it could be you know like um, aquatic plants, or it could be a mixture between terrestrial and algal. Dates are just are are, are boring because we just need them, but everything depends on. We use, most people have heard of carbon-14 dating. We use carbon-14 dating uh, in our analyses um, to get the older time scales of our cores. So for the last you know, few hundred years, we use other forms of dating. Uh, one is called lead-210 dating, which is a, a, a radioisotope that degrades like C14, carbon-14, but it has a shorter half-life, so you can use it in shorter time scales. And then we use one called cesium. Cesium is a man-made molecule, man-made element um, that was used in nuclear bomb testing in the early 1960s. Any way that we can grab a date 
we will. Because once you determine that date, then you jump into the newspapers. What happened? Was there a chemical spill in 1930? Did they introduce a new crop in 1930? Did the forest get cut down in 1930? So once we get a date, we start targeting in on that date. So establishing a proper dating model is so important to us. You know, especially in reservoirs that are used for human recreation and for human water supply, um, it's important to know that they don't act the same as other water resources, so things that could be stored in the middle of a natural lake could be actually in coves from you know, non-point sources or point sources. But things are just getting stored differently, and that's why it's important to look at reservoirs in comparison to you know, natural lakes. Sediments are really overlooked because they do store everything that comes in from the water. There is this relationship between what's happening in the water and what gets stored in the sediment that people often forget about. And so the sediments can really reveal what has happened over time and why things have happened. So if you're wondering about how water could be in the future, you can just look back at how it has been in the past. The past is related to the future as far as water quality and water quantity is concerned. We need to connect what ecosystems did in the past with what they're doing now with how to manage them for the future. And we need data, we need to communicate, and we need to involve uh, the citizens that are using the systems, uh, modern day scientists who are looking at modern day issues, and people like me who look at the past, and we need a a, a timeline picture to really understand how to have clean water for forever and uh, there's got to be communication in, 